Um, first of all, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Adam, most of all, for organizing this event. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, conflict and bargaining in Micronesia with implications for uh, mental health and suicide. Uh, I'm a, an assistant professor at Leiden University uh, in uh, suicide and suicide prevention. Uh, the Micronesians I'm talking about today are specifically Chonchuk or the people of Chuk, native to the Carolyn Islands and Chuk state of the Federated States of Micronesia. They are a, a, a population of approximately 50,000. Uh, their so social organization uh, was uh, typically organized around the matrilineal clan, and they were largely largely matrilocal. The traditional division of labor prior to the introduction of the cash economy was uh, for men gardening, deep sea fishing, warfare, canoe building, and uh, political roles. For women, it was inshore fishing, preparing meals and childcare. Today, both uh, uh, men and women are engaged in wage, wage and service sector labor, in addition to uh, subsistence, the same subsistence roles. Uh, Chonshu, consistent with their past as sea voyagers, they are highly mobile today. Uh, there is an agreement between the United States and three Micronesian states to allow um, them to come live and work in the U.S. or attend school. Um, so the population I actually worked with uh, was located in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon. Um, it's important to note that uh, migration is not unidirectional. They are continually moving around to satisfy the needs of the family, to make money, to go to school, to in service of the family. Um, right now in the United States, there are approximately two, uh, 270,000 Micronesians. Unfortunately, uh, Chonchuk and Micronesians uh, broadly have a high youth suicide rate and specifically a high male youth suicide rate. Uh, you can see right here, uh, this uh, over here is the rate per 100,000. Down here is the are the years uh, for Micronesians. Uh, in the 80s, this was the during the, the peak of the suicide epidemic, there were uh, 30, uh, 30 suicides per 100,000. That is triple the U.S. That is triple the U.S. And it's mostly, it's largely uh, young men 15 to 24 years old across Micronesia. And there's a large, very large sex skew, about 11 to one males to females. Uh, this is just to show you more recent. This is uh, unpublished data from Fran Hazel, who uh, is in charge of the Micronesian seminar and has collected all this data for the past 50 years, 60 years. Uh, it continues to be high today as of 2011 to 2015, uh, 25 uh, per 100,000. Uh, Fran Hazel, uh, Don Rubenstein, and other uh, ethnographers have collected uh, extensive cases on the suicides that have occurred in Micronesia, as many of them as they were able to get, probably almost all of them. And what they found is, is that the leading causes are conflict with parents and older siblings. About 70% of all the deaths were uh, preceded by uh, conflict with parents or older siblings who take on the parental role oftentimes in this culture. Uh, just that they used to be called Truk, tr or Truk, that's the wrong name. Chuk is the right name. Um, and the emotions that predominated were anger, largely anger, as well as shame. The Chukis conceptualize uh, suicide along a continuum called a mudamun. Uh, a mudamun means it's, it means a venting shame and anger that involves social withdrawal, refusing to eat or speak, running away from home, and in the most extreme, suicide. Previously, researchers have looked at why the suicide rate increased specifically in the 1960s with the introduction of the cash economy. Uh, and it's related to the effects of colonization, culture loss, rapid social change, disaffection. Um, Explanations include uh, the nuclearization of the family, that the cash economy fundamentally changed social organization in Chuk, uh, giving a, a greater role to parents and uh, uh, centralizing authority within the family, creating more conflict. Another explanation is the loss of traditional men's roles. And another one is the mismatch of socioeconomic status with material outcomes. So having more wealth, but not, even, but not being able to still achieve the, the status that you want. Other explanations in the Pacific, because in fact, uh, suicide rates are high across the Pacific as they are among all colonized people. Um, blocked opportunity, as in not being able to achieve your goals. 
uh, and socialization ambiguity due to culture change. That is not being sure what you're supposed to do in a situation, what the rules are, how one is supposed to behave. Um, so the suicidal crises, what were these conflicts about? Uh, at first glance, they seem quite trivial. Failure to transfer resources is a common one. Uh, one example was not getting a new t-shirt for Christmas. Another one was not receiving yeast requested for a drinking party. Other types of conflicts that precede suicidal crises, uh, admonishment by an authority figure, being scolded for singing too loudly is one example. But Fran Hazel is clear to state that what appears at first to be a single trivial incident is often the final manifestation of long-standing family tension, as our research showed in case after case. Uh, suicidal behavior across cultures is associated with conflict and adversity. Among the Tikopia of the Solomon Islands, uh, Firth writes that suicide is resorted to uh, as a form of protest of young men against fathers, as one example. In Papua New Guinea, tons of research on Papua New Guinea, uh, particularly women's suicidal behavior in Papua New Guinea, uh, it's a last resort of abused women, women quite powerless against men uh, in much of Papua New Guinea. Uh, Taraja of Indonesia, uh, it's related to intense feelings of in injustice, such as parental neglect. In South Africa, in women, it's associated with um, being subordinate. And in men, it's associated with thwarted dominance, not achieving the dominance that he wants to have. And in the Middle East, uh, women's recourse against kin and social norms. And a special issue in 2012 in cultural medicine and psychiatry, uh, situating suicide as an anthropological problem, Staples and, Ridger, and uh, Widger wrote, cultural anthropologists have repeatedly demonstrated how suicide exists as a socially legitimate means of protest when other more direct forms are not allowed by social convention, for example, in the context of gender inequality. Um, so if anyone's read uh, my work with Ed Hagen, we show uh, the CDC data often, because uh, it needs to be shown again and again that most suicidal behaviors are in fact non-fatal. Um, so these are hospital room visits for um, self-harm. And you can see for women age 20, there are 500 uh, suicide attempts to one death. And for men in similar age, it's about 200. 250. Uh, so I've often had people look at this and say, uh, wow, women are pretty dramatic. Well, actually, violence, sexual abuse, and bullying are leading predictors of suicidality. And in fact, uh, 2021, uh, the Youth Behavior Risk Survey showed that violence is on the rise in young people. They are being the victims of violence more. Uh, this 2021 data showed that 20% of female students experienced sexual violence by anyone in the last year. 14% had ever, ever been physically forced to have sex. What does that translate into? 25% of female students made a suicide plan. 10% of high school students attempted suicide. 4% of females and 2% of males were injured in a suicide attempt. So going back to, to anger and bargaining, bargaining uh, or anger, aggressive anger is a bargaining emotion, uh, according to the recalibrational theory of, of anger. That is that the aggressor is trying to increase the value that the target places on the aggressor's interests. Bargaining is a process of parties reaching an agreement on a social contract and power is the ability to coerce at a lower relative cost to the self. What kind of uh, power uh, might that be? Authority or leadership for one, that's such that other people defer to you, that your word is law, that other people will coordinate around you. Uh, having relevant knowledge about the situation that you can affect outcomes, maybe covertly. Uh, withholding resources, withholding benefits to others. We see this a lot in small scale societies, leaders, uh, providing uh, resources, or including mates, as well as withholding those resources to influence how other people behave. Other types of bargaining power, coalitional strength, and of course, physical formidability. But these are only effective if one has greater power along these dimensions. And if it's worth it to, to pay those costs. 
Uh, but the relatively powerless are not without options. In fact, we see this uh, an example played out quite a bit in recent years, labor strikes. Um, withholding cooperation is a means of imposing costs on the person you're in conflict with who has more power. However, it does require that the, the, the signaler, the person bargaining, also has to pay a high cost. This requires that the two parties or the parties have a shared stake in cooperation and have mutual dependence. Otherwise, they would walk away. Otherwise, they'd just walk away and form new relationships. So what types of relationships are these? Laborers and managers, uh, parents and offspring, husbands and wives, people often can't get away from easily. And in a labor strike, foregoing pay, which strikers do, is an honest signal that conditions aren't good and they believe they can get a, a greater share of the benefits. Similarly, a mudamun, uh, as described by Rubenstein and Hazel, is a strategy of self-debasement, such that one is paying a cost, lowering themselves in order to resolve a conflict. We see bargaining from weakness uh, across uh, all kinds of societies. Spirit possession is found all across the world. Um, just as in one example, I am Lewis's classic work, Ecstatic Religion, looking at spirit possession in Somalia found that it was really women in these communities and low status men who became spirit possessed and they received benefits. So one example would be a woman who uh, is in conflict with her husband because he's taking a second wife and she doesn't want him to. Um, so she'll become spirit possessed, uh, exhibiting her, cycle, her distress over the matter. Um, in the actual setting of being possessed, she will uh, display her despair. And uh, in return, the husband pays for that ceremony, for that healing ceremony, because it is a sick role. She's not pathologically sick, we don't think, but it, there are sick roles across societies in which people become sick to receive benefits. In this case, uh, often receiving gifts from the husband that he's continuing to show, maybe I'm doing this other thing, maybe it's a conflict of interest, but I still value this relationship. Running away from home, um, which in Shuk is uh, considered a suicide gesture, in fact. And it's uh, also described across societies. For instance, in Nisa, uh, uh, she describes, uh, Shostak describes how young women will run into the bush uh, if other people aren't letting her get a divorce. She'll stay there for the night, which is suicidal, quite frankly, because she's putting herself at risk. And uh, so they'll go look for her. But once it gets dark, they have to go back. Next day she returns and they say, OK, you know, she's shown the strength of her feelings that this is what she really wants. And they let her do it. Um, so running away from home or into the bush, widespread means of s signaling that one is discontent with the current situation. Uh, the present study I'm going to discuss um, uh, had sought to answer several questions about um, the spectrum of behaviors people display against a spectrum of conflicts. So, and really, can we use, can we look at conflict behavior more broadly to understand why in very rare situations people resort to suicide? So the key questions were, what are the causes of parent-child conflicts in this population? What strategies do offspring use to resolve conflicts? What factors are associated with severe conflicts? Do the cost, individu do the cost individuals pay to increase uh, pay increase with the severity of the conflict. Uh, so in order to carry this out, I conducted semi-structured interviews with uh, 58 participants, who some of whom reported more than one conflict. So there were a total of 72 conflicts. Uh, participants uh, were Chon Shuk and recruited from local churches and high schools in Portland, Oregon. And it took about two years uh, of, to collect this data, and it, as I did field work at a local church, Chon Shuk Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. All interviews were in English and most interviews were one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, here's a, a snippet of a case that one young woman uh, told me. Kaylin's parents, a 16-year-old girl, uh, Kaylin's parents were concerned that because she had a new boyfriend, she'd end up pregnant and not graduate from high school, a common concern among Chonchuk. When Kaylin did not return home one night, her mother discovered that she was with her boyfriend and started texting her to come home immediately. Afraid of a confrontation, Kaylin uh, ran away for several days. 
Because Chon Chuk interpret running away from home as a suicide threat, her parents, fearing the worst, called the police, gathered all the parents to all the family members to the house. When Kaylin returned home a couple days later, she found her extended family gathered there. She was forced to apologize to each member of her family, one by one, for what she had done. However, Kaylin's parents stopped scolding her for coming home late and permitted her to continue seeing her boyfriend. When I asked her how is her relationship with her parents now, she said, they let me do what I want. Um, so here are the, the causes of parent-child conflict. It is the proportion of causes uh, with uh, noting the lo if the location of the conflict was in the U.S. or the Federated States of Micronesia, because again, they, they migrate quite regularly. So some people are describing conflicts that occurred in the U.S. Some people are describing conflicts that occurred in Micronesia. And largely we see co similar conflicts uh, in both the U.S. and Micronesia. Activities with friends, education, both of those tended to be pretty low cost kind of conflicts. But the third one there, uh, family or home tension, that represents long standing conflict in the home, abuse, neglect, uh, witnessing violence at home, that sort of thing, being threatened uh, to be kicked out of the family. Um, this is a cluster heat map um, showing uh, the red check marks at the top uh, signify that a case uh, was severe and the cases are columns. Uh, yellow indicates that uh, positive for uh, the the cause. And uh, what we see here is that the family and home tension, the neglect, abuse, see those tended to be, by definition, just severe conflicts. Um, and the others uh, tended not to be so severe. Besides family and home tension, uh, we also see uh, time away from home and family and family responsibility were other so sources of severe conflicts. Uh, so here are the strategies that Offspring reported. They apologized, they cried, they reflected, they some, sometimes they were aggressive. Uh, they, used to, they used persuasion, uh, some prayed, they used partner choice. So for instance, actually trying to replace the parent with either another family member, such as an aunt or uncle or cousin, or uh, you know, going off with a boyfriend, girlfriend, or spouse to replace the, the parent as a daily cooperative partner. Um, withholding cooperation, this includes uh, a range of uh, behaviors that vary in cost from avoidance to running away. Uh, seeking assistance, uh, deceiving and acquiescing in a conflict, all of those reported. And what we see here, uh, I just wanted to note this particular cluster here of partner choice, withholding cooperation and seeking assistance tended to be associated with um, severe conflicts. Because in fact, uh, he really, well, get to that. So um, yes, so this is a logistic lasso regression of conflict severity as a function of child strategies and the values are odd ratios. And so in severe conflicts, yes, people use partner choice. Uh, they want to get away from their parents. They want to stop being abused by their parents. They want to stop being exploited for labor by their parents. Um, so they'll replace uh, the par parental relationship and go live with somebody else. Um, other conflicts, withholding cooperation, this includes, again, avoidance, running away, simply trying to not be around your family. Uh, and then less commonly, it didn't come up too much, but aggression was used, but less often. Um, yeah. Oh, and note that deception uh, was used when conflicts were not severe. And so outcomes, so deception. So if conflicts are not severe, deception works pretty well because mom and dad aren't paying attention. They're busy doing something else. And the kid goes, plays with her friends. Parents never know. Um, but for severe conflicts, people aren't going to do that because people are too vigilant. So, uh, so partner choice, withholding cooperation and seeking assistance were predictive of outcomes in the child's favor. So the child actually, uh, getting ultimately what they want in the end. So this is, here's a key question. Are the, are high cost strategies associated with high severity conflicts? Um, Yes, they are. So this is a mosaic plot. The area of each rectangle is proportional to the number of conflicts. Um, so the severity here, uh, red is no evidence of, or sorry, 
Green is no evidence of severity and red is evidence of severity. And these columns here are so the the person did not withhold any type of cooperation. Uh, they did a low cost cooperative, low cost withholding cooperation strategy like avoidance. And then high cost withholding uh, cooperation like running away. And we see that these high cost strategies are associated with the high severity conflicts. Summary of the findings. Um, most conflicts were low severity and were associated with low cost strategies. High cost strategies like running away, which, by the way, again, is a suicide threat. It's a suicidal gesture, were associated with high severity conflict, such as a, a threat of being kicked out of the family or sent away. Partner choice and withholding cooperation were associated with outcomes favoring the child. And high cost withholding cooperation behaviors can involve placing oneself at risk of harm, such as running away. So young women in the Pacific Northwest running away in the middle of the night, it's not safe in Portland, Oregon, by the way, um, nor is it safe in Chuuk to be out in the middle of the night on your own as a young woman. Um, they are placing themselves at harm. Some one woman reported uh, staying with a male acquaintance who she didn't even know very well. Um, so there are risks involved with these behaviors. Clean remarks, Chonshuk and other colonized populations have a high have high rates of suicide, substance abuse, and violence. And this is related to cultural loss, rapid social change, imposed economic systems, poverty, lack of opportunity, things we all know. We know that much uh, violence and suicidal behaviors are expressions of grievances, rage, and or despair. Uh, for instance, mass shooters, people who uh, do research on that, this is a mainstream idea. They are aggrieved. They are enraged and likely in despair. Sexual assault victims who uh, attempt or die by suicide are aggrieved. Uh, victims of bullying, the politically oppressed, the list goes on. Evolutionary approaches to behavior must take account of the strategies of the powerless to understand, for one thing, cooperation, but also, I think, too, mental health. Um, so I'm going to give the last word to uh, my friend, Joe Inlet, who I believe is uh, listening in. Um, he is a former consular general of the FSM consulate in Portland, Oregon, and he is now a PhD fellow uh, at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and I apologize, he's one of the most, uh, he's one of the best orators I've ever heard. So I'm not going to say this as well as he would, uh, but bear with me. Chonshuk are a people in transition being pushed and pulled between waves of change. The social issues are the results of living the transition between the outer world and the interchanges of culture and society. But the one constant that provides the resources for our own redemption are our relationships and connection to our cultural roots. They are like the stars that guided Micronesian navigators of old to voyage the vast oceans with confidence and inner peace. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kristen. We have quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, maybe we'll start with a question from the room. Um, can I use the microphone? Or... Sure. I mean, I don't need to, but yes. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, how would you respond? Is this working? Is the microphone working? Yeah. Uh, how would you respond um, uh, to the suggestion from the graph that you showed of the self-harm of suicidality as opposed to suicide, that that graph demonstrates that suicidality and completed suicide are in fact independent phenomena and separate because those two um, graphs just don't shadow each other at all, neither in terms of gender balance nor in terms of the peaks. Sure. Well, um, it, there's a continuum of risk, right? Uh, we know, for instance, that access to means like leth lethal weapons, like guns, there are deaths because of guns that would not have otherwise occurred. That we have that data from California. Owning a gun uh, puts you at greater risk of, you know, when you're in a suicidal crisis, that you're going to resort to a method that is extremely lethal. And I think the probability of death when using a gun is actually 89%, which is actually, it's surprisingly not 99%, but it's, um, and... Yeah, so a lot to unpack there because a lot of it has to do, you know, we talk about males and females. There's differences in risk taking, for instance, that likely account for why men use costlier, riskier strategies than women do. Um, but I don't think I think there is a continuum and we need to 
uh, unravel the continuum. I do not think that they are separate. I do not believe they are separate. I don't think the evidence points that way. Hey, do we have any questions from the Zoom audience? No, I'm on the fan, but it's not Ellen. Thanks, Kristen. Really interesting stuff and very, um, yeah, evocative. And what's really cool about it is it has this uh, perhaps simple-ish implication that if you give people ways out and you you prevent them having to get to this point of, you know, this huge calamity where they have to, you know, go and in engage in these behaviors. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder what you think. I mean, I guess it would differ between societies, but I wonder what you think... Uh, would be the recommendations for like public health or maybe education systems or families as to, as to how to prevent it getting to this kind of crisis point where the suicidal behavior yeah. uh, happens. Taking responsibility for one. Um, so we're seeing that in the U.S., a, a, a school, a prep school took responsibility for the death of a suicide, which is almost never done uh, because it was due to bullying. It was also a $76,000 a year prep school or something like that. And so people involved had a lot of bargaining power. Um but it was due to bullying and um, these deaths occur and no one schools don't take responsibility when they should really you kids should go to school and be protected and not be you know bullied to death um so that's one we talk about institutions like that um uh, i think we need uh, i think we as a society could do a lot more in terms of you know there are suicide hotlines and all that but i i think you know maybe we could do better uh, in terms of actually dealing with social issues addressing so addressing for instance violence which we're seeing a young women are, are are being violated more that needs to be taken seriously that's an avenue that needs to be approached um and less so you know uh simply focusing on therapy or medication cool anyone else you have two minutes what? again um yeah, no, um, um, you know, I'm sorry that I'm raising challenges, but um, um, how would you explain uh, the fact that uh, women are the, usually the most powerless in most traditional societies, but their suicide rate is always lower? No, that's not true. It's not true. There, I can I will send you those articles. Actually, there are places where the suicide rate in women is higher. It, Papua New Guinea, for instance. Um, so no, that's not true. It, it, that's something that we need to understand why, uh, that research isn't being done. It's very difficult to do that research. Um, but it's not systematically the case that, but is uh, that not the exception no. other than the rule? Because in most, let's say, um, let's say Middle Eastern societies, the male female is three to one, four to one. Mm -hmm. Um, and despite the fact that women are quite oppressed. Yeah, but we're talking about death. We're talking about suicide death. Yeah, the predictor for being su any any type of suicidal is being a woman and being young. Um, okay, thank you, Kristen. We're at the end of your time. Thank you very much.